Thank you, John. Hello, I'm Kirk Aarons, Business Development Manager at Parker Lloyd. Joining me today is Zach Light. Hello, everyone. This is Zach Light. I'm the lead project engineer for our downhole tools for Parker Lord. I analyze and design all of our downhole isolators used in the MWD and directional drilling operations. Today, we'd like to welcome you to our presentation on mitigating shock and vibration in downhole drilling operations. We're going to start out with a little history of Lord and Parker. Uh, Lord was founded in 1924, acquired by Parker Hannafin in 2019. Our division headquarters is in Cary, North Carolina. We have manufacturing facilities located all over North America and internationally, with our main engineering facility being located in Erie, Pennsylvania, where we perform most of our product development and testing. Uh, we serve many markets that include oil and gas, transportation, aerospace, defense, electronics, construction, and agriculture, to name a few. All right, so here's what we'll cover today. We're going to go through downhole systems, shock and vibration, the dynamic inputs, fundamental shock and vibration theory, mitigating shock and vibration, and our downhole solutions. Let's dive into the first topic, downhole systems. So what you see here is an assortment of our downhole systems, starting on the left with our axial isolator. Then next in the red, we have our snubber series. Below that, we have our centralizer fin. To the right of that, we have our soft shoes. And what we've done is we've been able to leverage our world-class vibration and motion control capabilities to increase the reliability and performance of the high value components used in directional drilling operations. Thanks, Kirk, for uh, providing the overview slides. And next, we'll be moving into our shock versus vibration section of the presentation. However, uh, first, we'd like to um, put our first poll question out there for our audience. So the first poll question is, are you currently using an isolator or shock tool? Yes or no? Um, we'll give you a second here to submit your answers, and then we'll provide feedback later in the presentation. Thank you everyone for responding to that poll question. And now we'll move on to the rest of the presentation. So to start out the shock versus vibration section, I wanted to pull in a high level overview of shock versus vibration related to everybody's um, daily lives. So what you see here is an example of shock and an example of vibration. Shock on the left-hand side would be an example of like a pothole as you're driving down the road, you feel a large sudden impulse, however, it's normally short-lived and there's only a few events. In comparison to the right-hand side, we have a series of rumble strips. These rumble strips represent vibration and typically are lower amplitude but higher frequency um, compared to shock. I'd like to start out by introducing the three modes of dynamic inputs to your BHA or your bottom hole assembly. Typically, we see axial vibration as the high bar when it comes to shock and vibration and downhole applications. This is a result from bit bounce or jarring. Moving up from axial vibration, the next tall bar that we see in our applications is lateral vibration due to either drill string bending or also whirl. And then finally, we have torsional vibration, typically due to a stick slip scenario. Next, I'd like to move into the fundamental shock and vibration theory of the MWD system. Looking at the MWD system, it represents a mass spring damper system, where the mass is the MWD string itself, and then your spring damper system is the isolator, or the workhorse of the system, which provides the shock and vibration mitigation to protect your electronics and your tool string. In order to successfully mitigate shock and vibration, you must allow for displacement in your system, so your tool string must travel in the axial direction or in the lateral direction to effectively mitigate shock and vibration. In addition, artificial damping can be added into the system by introducing centralizing fins inside the drill collar, which will provide damping to add to the shock and vibration mitigation. Next, we'll look at a force response system and the two different systems that we'll be looking at today. As you can see on the left-hand side here, we have a video of a basic sighted system. You can see where the base is providing inputs up into the mass. This would be similar to your car traveling down the road where you hit potholes or bumps in the roads and it's trying to protect the occupants from the shock or vibration. This is similar to your MWD system where we are trying to protect the electronics and the tool string from the inputs from the BHA. 
In comparison, another type of excited system is a mass excited system. This would be similar to a washer machine or an engine mount where the engine or the washer machine drum is driving the inputs into the system and the exterior of the system is what is being isolated from the mass. Next, we'll move on to shock. The dominant input to an MWD tool string is shock. A series of shock events can often be confused with the harmonic input of a vibration input. However, the shock event is modeled as a half sine pulse shown in the left-hand plot. This would be similar to a sledgehammer blow as you take a hammer and you bounce it off a piece of concrete. It comes back instantly. There's no damping in the system, it provides that shock. First, we'll look at the shock of a non-isolated system. So as you can see on the left-hand plot here, shows the input curve equals the output curve. However, there are circumstances where the output curve can be amplified in a rigid mounted system. Next, we'll talk about frequency ratio. This is critical in a rigid mounted system because this is where amplification can occur. When natural frequency approaches shock frequency, such as the plot on the left-hand side, that 100G input amplifies to 140 Gs. Next, we'll move on to an isolated system and the resultant shock into your tool string. As you can see from the left-hand side, we have our input curve, which would show our input into your BHA, and we have our output curve, with it, which is significantly flatter, however, over a longer time duration. By flattening this curve and extending the time duration of the shock, we're able to decrease the accelerations felt in your tool string. Consider a sledgehammer with a slab of rubber on top of concrete. As you hit it, you don't get nearly as much feedback as if you were to hit it without the slab of rubber. So to sum up mitigating shock and vibration, there's four takeaways from this slide that we'd like to present to you. First is tool investment, less risk and lower operating costs later by spending the upfront cost and isolators. You must allow for sway space and assemblies to allow damping to remove energy from the system and elongate the shock curve. Next, you would need to incorporate damping into your assembly to remove energy, either by elastomeric, viscous, or frictional through the use of isolators, friction, or sway space. Finally, each isolator must be designed for targeted inputs and parameters in order to most effectively mitigate shock and vibration. Next, Kirk will be talking about our Parker Lord engineering capabilities. But first, let's launch our second poll question. Which of the following are you most likely to use? Top mounted tools, bottom mounted tools, or collar based tools? Thank you everyone for responding to that poll question. And now we'll move on to the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Zach. Shortly we'll be moving into our downhole solutions. And what we're gonna cover today uh, is gonna start out with our isolators. And the first product that we developed was the tool snubber. So this is the snubber that's mounted on the actual chassis inside of your housing and your tool string. Next, we'll talk about the axial isolator, which is an inline isolator that fits between your lower end and your pulsar. Following that, we'll cover the centralizer fan, which can be used to centralize the axial isolator or can be used in your interconnect assemblies. We're gonna follow that up with our soft shoe isolator, which is a product that's mounted below your meal shoe sleeve and housed within the UBHO. And then we'll follow that up with some of our pulsar components covering the bellow boots and pulsar sleeves. First, we're gonna talk about our snubber line, which protects critical electronics, pulsars, gammas, and battery components from dynamic shock and vibration inputs. You see from the picture on the bottom, we have standard and custom snubbers, which we've developed. Uh, the standard are compatible with existing interfaces uh, using all Lord design processes and materials to create better durability. And we're able to control uh, with a fine level of control the stiffness, which provides excellent isolation. So when we were developing our snubbers, we asked the customer base, what is it they were looking for in a snubber? And so we had a couple competitors on the market and what you're looking at here is a couple different pieces of information. In the top table, what you see is our accelerated endurance test results. So for this, what we did is we put our snubber up against competitor A and competitor B. For competitor A, we call that a stiff isolator. Based on the feedback we got from customers is this one had a long life, but had poor isolation. Competitor B 
was a, what we'll call a soft isolator, had excellent isolation, but a short life in the field. So our goal with designing our snubber was to combine these two and have a snubber with excellent isolation and a long life. So looking at this top table here, again, at the accelerated endurance test results, what we did is we put each snubber with a suspended mass of four and a half pounds, so simulating module on the tool string in a shaker table setup. And we ran that shaker table, as you can see for competitor B, for approximately four minutes before that snubber came apart and had a catastrophic elastomer failure. Competitor A, we were able to run it for about 30 minutes before the shock and vibration inputs on it developed cap screw failures or how it was affixed. So the cap screw is actually popped off for the mass that was holding onto the snubber. So all that energy was being transferred to those cap screws and the cap screws ended up being the weak link there. And then when we put the Lord snubbers in there, we were able to run it for 40 hours without failure. So extrapolating that to downhole hours, that four minutes for competitor B, it was the equivalent of about three hours of downhole use. For competitor A, their 30 minutes on the table was equivalent to about 22 and a half hours before failure. Ours run for 40 hours without failure is equivalent to about 1800 hours. But we now know from real world data that most of our customer base is running these well over 2,000 hours, some of them up to 3,000 hours. Zach, do you have anything else to add? Yes, Kirk, I can add um, with respect to the plot shown below. Uh, so the shot response comparison shown below is, are the results of our testing versus the Lord Snubber competitor A, competitor B. As you can see, competitor A has significantly less shock mitigation and isolation properties when compared back to the Lord Snubber as well as competitor B. However, when you look at competitor B and the longevity shown above, it is significantly less than what we see with our Lord Snubbers. That was great. Thanks, Zach. Moving along to the axle isolator, the purpose of this tool is to protect the entire MWD tool string from BHA shock and vibration inputs. This is located between the lower end and the pulser driver, as you can see in the picture below. In real world testing, we've been able to reduce shock inputs by 70 to 80 percent. We're able to do this in part because our elastomer has a nonlinear spring rate, something which we'll get into a little bit later. The Excel isolator has a modular design, which helps for the ease of serviceability. Another added feature is we're self-pressure compensating due to the addition of two ports on the housing. With all our axial isolator, snubber, soft shoe products you'll see here today, we have standard and high temperature elastomer available. So now we're going to look at some performance data that was given to us early on in our testing by a customer who ran this in the field. So what you see here is run one, which was run without a Lord Axial Isolator. And as everybody I'm sure is familiar with, you can see the shock and vibration that occurred on run one. Now we're all willing to give the caveat that we all know that no two runs are the same. However, for the purposes of real world testing, that's really all that you can do is back to back runs. What really excited us when we got this data back was run two. If you look at it with the Lord Axial Isolator installed, we were able to decrease the amount of shock events between the initial kickoff point and TD. Here's a different look at the same data. So here you're seeing a histogram of the shock counts that were recorded. And again, on run one, there was 1,495 shock counts between 30 and 40 Gs that were recorded with another 70 above 40 Gs recorded. And then on the right side, you see run two, where you had just those two events that, that actually were recorded, which was the kickoff point and TD. Next, we're gonna move into the serviceability and maintenance on the axial isolator. As you can see from the diagram on the right, the overall length from shoulder to shoulder starts out at 36 inches. When that distance reaches 35 inches, you've reached the life of the elastomer. That's one inch of set. So that one inch of set equates to 100% like on a battery. So if you were to take this out of the hole and measure it and it came up 35 and a half inches, you need, you have about 50% of your life left on the elastomer. 
So one of the nice things about the axial isolator is it's ease, ease of service and maintenance. A dirty tool coming in from the field can be completely broken down, cleaned, inspected, and put back together in approximately 30 to 40 minutes. I often get a lot of questions about what's involved with the maintenance and the service of the axial isolator. And we have three pictures at the bottom here to kind of demonstrate those different levels of service. On the left, what you see is what we call a level one service. That's your seal kit. So there's your piston head, your guide bands, your O-rings, and your anti-rotation pins. So the best practice is each time this tool comes back in the shop from a job would be to perform a level one service and replace these parts. A level two service would incorporate the elastomer in the middle. And this is after that elastomer has reached its life down hole. So 35 inches or less, you're gonna be performing a level two service, which will include replacing those six elastomer stacks. And they are all replaced at one time because the six of them act as a system. Level three service would move on into your metal components. And I have a picture of our male and female anti-rotation here as an example, but you'd also be inspecting the center shaft, the outer housing, the ceiling sub, just to make sure there aren't any pits or wash points of concern that you would need to address. At this time, we're gonna launch our third and final poll question. And that question is, what is the most critical repair and maintenance factor when servicing an isolator? Is it difficulty, time, or cost? We'll give you a few minutes to answer. Thank you for those answers. Next, we're gonna talk about our centralizer fan. This is a versatile product that can be used not only to improve the centralization of the axial isolator, which provides for some lateral shock mitigation, but it can also be used on various customer interconnects. So you can see the axial centralizer is the figure on the top of the page there. Below that is what it looks like installed on our axial isolator. Below that, it's installed on an axial isolator. And to the left of that is our dedicated lateral isolator. So here you can get a closer look at our patent pen and lateral isolator. In the following slide, Zach is gonna go over some data that we've received from downhole testing. Thanks, Kirk. Next, we'll be looking at some lateral shock and vibration data provided by our customer base. This data is a result from downhole field trials, resulting in four different setups. There was no shock isolator ran, there was an axial isolator without fins, there was an axial isolator with fins, and then finally there was an axial isolator and a lateral isolator with fins. So I know there's a lot of data here to look through. However, I'm going to highlight a couple key columns. The first column I'd like to highlight is a greater than 30 G shock per hour count. So as you look at this, this is where the successes are found in the lateral isolator. Looking at the gamma module, we see upwards of 94% shock mitigation. Moving to the directional module, this number decreases slightly because we're going away from our lower end. However, it still stays around 86%. And then once you move to the pulsar module, this is fairly consistent with our directional module at 88%. We chose the 30G shock per hour, the 20G shock per hour, and the 10G shock per hour as our metrics to baseline against, since this is our typical marker points from our customers. When looking at average shock, this would be similar to an RMS value, as we still see between 30 and 70% shock reduction. Next, I'll be turning it back over to Kirk to talk about the soft shoe isolator. Thanks, Zach. Like Zach said, now we're gonna cover the soft shoe isolator. This is a isolator that goes below your meal shoe sleeve and embedded into your UBHO. So the purpose of this was to act like a snubber for the entire tool string. It has a higher stiffness than the axial isolator, which allows it to respond to a higher frequency shock. And it also provides a shorter package where spacing may be critical. Now Zach's going to discuss a little bit about the soft shoe isolator performance. Thanks, Kirk. So these two plots that you see here are some of our lab test data that we've done on the soft shoe isolator. For example, on the left-hand side, this is a half sine 100 G input with a half millisecond pulse width. You can see the red line represents the input shock and then the green line would be the attenuated response resulting into the existing 
shock that's transmitted to your tool string. As you can see, it's significantly lower than what the input shock shows. Looking at the right-hand side, this is a shock transmissibility plot of the pulse duration versus the level of transmissibility. So as expected, as you increase pulse duration, you typically see slightly more transmissibility into your tool string. However, it's below one, so you're still resulting in a lower shock transmissibility than in a rigid mounted system. Now I'll be turning it back over for Kurt to talk through some field data. Thank you, Zach. Now we're gonna dive into the run data provided to us from a customer in the field. So on runs one, two, and three, you can see he ran it without the Lord soft shoe. Run four, he put us on, they installed the Lord soft shoe and continued drilling their horizontal. Continuing on, we're now taking a look at the vibration seen on these runs. So run one, two, and three, and in, specifically in two and three, you can see how the, the peaks are higher, the mean line is higher or higher than when run four were and with the Lord soft shoe. So we're able to take out those peaks and settle down some of that vibration to a more manageable level. What we're looking at here is a breakout of the shock that was recorded on these runs. So you can see in run three through the curve, the shocks are more condensed, they're higher peaks. So a lot of activity there. And then the run four with the soft shoe installed, you can see the peaks are shorter, they're lower, the events are more spread out. By looking at this, you can see that it was, that the soft shoe was doing its job and made the run easier for the customer. On this slide, now we're looking at the shock events. So as you can see in run three through the curve, a lot of shock events were recorded. You can see how they're recorded in rapid succession. The peaks are a lot higher. You move it over to the Lord soft shoe installed. You see, we've significantly reduced the peaks that you see. Also, the number of shock events even recorded was more spread out, showing that the soft shoe was in there doing a good job mitigating shock and vibration on that run. Next, we're going to take a look at a few of our pulsar components that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. On the, on the picture on the left there, you see a bellow boot, and this is there to protect that poppet actuator. Uh, that stops and starts the mud pulses. On the right, we have a compensation membrane or a sleeve, as some might call it, that allows the pulse to be transmitted up the mud column. And each of these are made with our own Lord elastomers that are resistant to swelling, which increases the life and reliability. And something that also sets apart our compensation membranes is it's an extruded piece. Where we can control the width of the wall throughout the length of the product. And because it's extruded, it has no seam lines. All right, so you may be asking yourself, what's the value of downhole isolation systems? Well, the downhole isolator is designed based on a combination of specialized knowledge of dynamics and elastomer formulation. So our solutions, as we've shown, can mitigate upwards of 90% of shock and vibration inputs in real world environments. And what does that mean? That means it's reduced downtime, increased productivity, keeping your tools out of repair, protecting those PMTs, protecting those MPUs, protecting those triple power supplies, keeping those costly boards in your tools out of that repair cycle and in operation. Now I'm gonna to toss it over to Zach for the key takeaways. Thanks, Kirk. So I hope everyone enjoyed our presentation um, and the four key takeaways that we'd like you to go home with are the difference between shock and vibration, why it's important to add damping and sway space into your systems, preferably ahead of time so that isolators can be designed in with all the correct parameters. More reliable parts allow for longer drilling without interruption, so you reduce downtime and increase production. And finally, to plan ahead to prevent unexpected and costly downtime when selecting isolators and shock tools to protect your MWD tool strings and expensive electronics. Thank you all for joining the webinar and I hope you enjoyed our presentation and now we'll be moving on to questions.